Welcome to Forgotten Hollywood on Therapy Cable. Here is the Hollywood backstory. In 1963, The Judy Garland Show was a celebrated entry on CBS's fall schedule. But facing Bonanza, the series ultimately didn't capture enough viewers to last beyond its first season. Nevertheless, it showcased the iconic Garland with impressive guests including Barbara Streisand, Diane Carroll, Mel Torme, Bobby Darin, Ethel Merman, June Allison, Jack Jones, and daughters Liza Minnelli and Lorna Luft. Welcome to Forgotten Hollywood, streaming on the Therapy Cable Channel. Here's your host, Manny Pacheco. Welcome to our program. Forgotten Hollywood on Therapy Cable is a journey and part of a franchise that includes a book series that tells America's story through the eyes of character actors from Hollywood's golden age. We also have a blog site at ForgottenHollywood.com a radio show that airs on 90.1 FM KBPK in Southern California, and a documentary currently in production. Today's guest is historian and author John Fricke, an expert on all things Judy Garland. John has spoken about Oz and Garland everywhere from the Today Show to CNN, NPR, National Public Radio, the Museum of Modern Art, the Film Society of the Lincoln Center, and the Paley Center, all in New York, as well as the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in Los Angeles. And he's also an Emmy Award winner and co-producer, co-writer of the 2004 PBS American Masters program, Judy Garland by Myself. Sony Pictures Television Network's Get TV has announced a weekly night of variety and talk programming from television's golden age, currently airing weekly on Mondays. The lineup is headlined by none other than The Judy Garland Show. Welcome, John Fricky. We appreciate you being thank here you. with us. Oh, thank you, Manny. You're giving me the chance to do something I've been doing pretty much since I was five years old, and that's talking about Judy Garland. I fell... Early, I fell hard, and uh, I have never seen any reason to uh, change my uh, initial feeling that she was well worth any attention she could be paid. Before we get into the television show, um, obviously a lot led up to the fact that television was going to be an appropriate format for her, but obviously we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about how she was quickly discovered for those who somewhere on the planet who didn't know that she was actually discovered there with Deanna Durbin uh, and, uh, and, and then went to MGM and then of course uh, made The Wizard of Oz and had a, this storied career. Maybe we can just brush on that just a little bit. Certainly. Well, she grew up in a, a vaudeville family. Her dad managed a small movie theater in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Her mom accompanied the silent films on the piano, and Judy's two older sisters were already singing between films, as, as were the two parents. And when Judy came along, she burst out on that stage at 30 months uh, with a rehearsed and planned uh, chorus of Jingle Bells, but when the audience clapped, uh, she refused to get off the stage, and she sang it four more times until her grandmother had to come on and cart her off. But from that time on, she was part of the family act, the Gum family, that was the family name, moved to California in 1927, and shortly thereafter, uh, the mother uh, worked kind of industriously at getting the girls into the greater echelons of show business. They did a lot of local radio, they did some early uh, musical short films when Judy was seven, but by the time Judy was 11, 12 and doing small-time vaudeville, the act was getting extraordinary reviews and it wasn't because of the Gum sisters, it was because of Baby Gum, the little one, who as somebody said at age 12 sang with a voice that could be heard in a huge theater without a microphone and sang at 12 like a 30-year-old woman who had been hurt. There was that, that soul and that God-given kind of charisma that very few people in entertainment have. And when her oldest sister got married and the act broke up, Judy was sent out by an agent and got signed to an MGM contract when she was 13. This a few months later, the, what, the Wilshire Ebell Theater is what I heard. 
Wilshire Ebel, people saw her also at the Paramount, also uh, at private parties. She had three separate MGM auditions between late 1934 and September 35, and it was the last one that, that got her the contract. Of course, and, when uh, that happened, September, then, of course, tragedy strikes, her father passes away. Six months after she signed with Metro, her dad died of, of spinal meningitis. And uh, as Judy said later, in a confessional moment, she said, now there's nobody on my side, because she was especially close to her dad. Uh, her mother had always been brusque and businesslike and a stage mother to a certain extent. Part of the reason for that was wanting to keep the three daughters away from home as much as possible, because the father was having uh, gay relationships with local gentlemen and um, young men. And one wanted to protect a family from that in the 1930s. But it was something that Judy herself didn't understand at age 12 or 13 and wasn't really even aware of. So she got to MGM where she was valued for her voice, was put on a diet instantly. She was only 4 foot 11. That's as tall as she ever got. So there was a weight problem. She was made to feel not terribly attractive, not physically good enough for the movies, but you know we're keeping you because of your voice, in effect. And that snowballed over those first three, four years at Metro. She made uh, eight feature films, the seventh of which was The Wizard of Oz. And, that now, and, and, and really, that's even a sad story in the fact that Louis B. Mayer was not quiet about the fact that he wanted Shirley Temple to play uh, Dorothy. Well, actually, it wasn't, it wasn't Louis B. Mayer, it was Nick Skank from Lowe's Incorporated, who ran MGM from the East Coast. Louis B. Mayer had given Arthur Freed the okay, go ahead, fine, take the property of Wizard of Oz and make it with Judy Garland. And Mervyn Leroy, who came in the, as the producer, wanted Judy as well. But when the pre-production budget leapt over $2 million for a Technicolor live actor musical fantasy, the money people panicked. And uh, New York liked Judy as well, but they did say, she's not a box office star yet. Can we get Shirley Temple? And that's where that whole legend uh, blew up. But it was very much a, an intra-corporate, behind-closed-doors, couple-of-day thing. Uh, Shirley was never really going to be in the running because 20th Century Fox wasn't going to loan her to Metro no matter what, uh, specifically not for the five or six months it was expected Wizard of Oz would take to make. And everybody at MGM was delighted because Judy was Dorothy. Judy was a Midwestern girl swept up by the cyclone of her talent, if you will, and into that crazy world of, of show business and movies. Uh, so it was the perfect marriage of actor and role uh, over the rainbow, and the scripts were all written for Judy. All of that was done without Shirley Temple in mind. What about the uh, relationship with her, obviously, in the film career of uh, the most popular actor at the time, probably, was Mickey Rooney, and then she was paired with him in a number of movies. Well, the, the idea was that Mickey was rising so quickly in 37 and 38, and the Andy Hardy films, the family series, uh, was taking off in a way that nobody expected. They could make a Hardy picture for $250,000, $300,000, and send it out and make a couple of million, because those pictures were so popular. And Judy was put into the fourth one because they knew it would be a boost for her, which indeed it was. And even while she was making Wizard of Oz, Arthur Freed had plans to take her right from Oz to the film version of the Broadway musical Babes in Arms, in which Mickey would sing and dance for the first time and Judy would be his leading lady. So uh, they just kind of came up together. And uh, those vehicles were Mickey-driven, but now we watch them, and as much as Mickey is all over the map, you can't take your eyes off Judy because she's the calm, sincere, real center of those stories. And she's the heart, it, yeah. Yes, exactly. That You picked exactly the right word. And uh, she became the heart of what was known as the Freed Unit. Arthur Freed became the greatest MGM musical producer. There were others, Joe Pasternak, Jack Cummings, but... Freed is the one who brought in Gene Kelly, who brought back Fred Astaire, who imported Comden and Green and Chuck Walters and Bob Alton, all the Broadway people, and started to make films like For Me and My Gal and Meet Me in St. Louis and Ziegfeld Follies and The Harvey Girls. Now, all of those were Judy Garland vehicles. Now, when did the problems emerge with MGM? I know that they had an acrimonious ending, but what led to that? What led to the, 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 the dismissal of Judy Garland from MGM eventually? 
Uh, she physically just caved in, and this had happened as early as 1943. She had done something like 18 films in uh, six years, and one after another, plus radio shows, plus recording sessions for DECA, plus army camp tours at the onset of, of World War II. And she was incapable, as a reporter wrote in 1961 when Judy was on the Carnegie Hall concert tour, in, she was incapable of holding anything of herself in reserve. She gave it all to the audience uh, with great control. It wasn't like flinging it at them like a Betty Hutton, say, but it was all of her own emotion going out there and that talent. And she just wore out. Uh, by the time uh, MGM was getting the best properties for her and the best composers and lyricists and script writers, uh, she was worn. She'd been at the studio for 10 years. In fact, she wanted to drop out of MGM as early as 1945 uh, after her marriage to Vincent Minnelli. It was like, I don't want a long-term contract. I want to do one film a year, not two, not three. Maybe I'll do a radio series too. But she knew she was overworking and she did not like the fact that she'd become uh, dependent at times on uh, prescription medication to get her to go to sleep after a crazy day, to wake her up again and to suppress her weight so that she wouldn't go above MGM's prescribed 95 pounds of, of camera-thin photographable actress. By the late 1940s, by the mid-1940s, this was the problem. And MGM romanced her into signing again for another five years. They said, well, you only have to do two pictures a year. We'll give you your husband, Vincent Minnelli, as your director. Uh, but the trouble is when you did an Arthur Freed musical, it took four or five months, sometimes six months. They were not going to hesitate about doing everything they could to make it as good as possible. So where was the respite? Plus, unfortunately, after her first film after going back to MGM post the birth of Liza Minnelli was a, a film called The Pirate, which was very much a Minnelli-conceived, artificial, uh, beautifully colored, beautifully designed, beautifully mounted film musical for Judy and Gene Kelly. But he was directing it and producing it with the musical arrangements of Kay Thompson. It was a movie musical being produced for an audience that just didn't exist. It was too rarefied. And Judy knew this and uh, caved in as a result almost as soon as she went back to Metro. By contrast, they took Minnelli off her next film, Easter Parade. Chuck Walters, with whom she danced in a couple films and who had been promoted to a director, came in, turned Vincent Minnelli's very dark, Hal Joey, heavy duty Easter Parade script into a musical comedy. She whipped through it in no time at all. The picture came in under budget and was MGM's biggest hit of 1948. The trouble is they just didn't give her enough time off from then on. She was giving them one or two top 10 box office films a year in 46, 48, 49, 50. MGM wanted more. And uh, she'd make one and start the next and cave in. She'd rest, she'd make another one, be a success, do another and cave in. And understandably, MGM couldn't take that. But there was very little sympathy uh, for her. And there had been very little help along the way until it was too late. Uh, and even then, when MGM finally gave her time off to go to Boston to a uh, psychiatric hospital to get her off the medication, to build up her weight, to get her above 85 pounds, 88 pounds. Um, you know, the, oh, we'll pay for it. We'll pay for it. And then we'll take the money out of your salary that we've laid out for you. It doesn't matter that your movies have made uh, $50 million, $60 million, $70 million for us. Right. I, I want to talk about the, the fact that they broke apart mainly because Louis B. Mayer went away and Dor Dory Sherry took over. It Was that part of the problem? Well, that was part of Mayer was still there. He left about a year after Judy did, but Mayer had uh, more or less ceded some control to Dory Sherry, who was very much into message pictures, very much against the star system, not interested in musicals especially, even though the musicals were still keeping Metro afloat. It certainly wasn't most of Dory Sherry's heavier product. But Dory Sherry, who had been a great good friend of Judy's, ate years earlier and whom she had consoled over problems with his own career, uh, she said when all of her troubles hit, Dory Sherry was like a stranger to her. And Eddie Bracken, great comic actor, uh, 
who did Judy's last MGM film, Summer Stop, when Judy was up and down and in and out and there and not there, it came to the point where he had to finish his scenes or he was going to lose a Broadway contract. And he went to Dory Sherry in the upper echelon and said, can't you get her to come in? And they said, no, she won't. We would the hell with her, in effect. And Eddie Bracken said, may I call her? And they said, well, you can call her, but it's not going to do any good. So Eddie Bracken called Judy at home and explained the situation and that I might lose this Broadway show if I don't get my scenes done. And she said, I'll be there at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And she was, and they finished it. And Eddie Bracken said that was the thing with Judy Garland. If you asked her nicely, it was done like that. But if you bossed her, if you bullied her, if you threatened her, she shut down. She didn't flourish under that. And uh, that's simplistic. And of course, it's not the whole story. But I think it's indicative of what the problem was at right. Metro at that time. She left Metro, and obviously there was a. She was in the wilderness for a couple of years, but then she came back strong with *The Star Is Born*. Obviously, an independent production. Yes. Uh, but, the, but again, the problem was is that it was edited, probably edited her out, right out of an Academy Award. In my uh, in my a, my feeling, that's is. a safe statement. Yeah. And then, of um, course, uh, the other wonderful performance that she gave, obviously, was in Judgment at Nuremberg, where uh, very heavy message-laden picture, all-star cast, including Spencer Tracy, Richard Whitmark, Montgomery Cliff, Burt Lancaster, Marlena Dietrich. I, but yet it was Maximilian it was, Schell won the Oscar. Maximilian yes. Schell won the Oscar, and Montgomery Clift and Judy Garland nominated for Academy Awards. It was those times when she didn't win those Academy Awards that really were hard on her. I think so. I think she uh, felt after MGM that Hollywood was pretty much against her, and this was cemented by the fact that she didn't win the Oscar for A Star Is Born, which is by any. Uh, standards to this day, one of the great all-around performances that anybody's ever given in a film. Singing, dancing, acting, comedy, drama. Uh, and then that indefinable thing that pulls an, a watching audience, watching a cold medium like film, into the story so that you participate in it. That was, that was one of her great talents. Uh, but we have to point out to you mentioned the wilderness in between MGM and Stars Born. Well, the wilderness involved her going back to her vaudeville roots and going to the London Palladium and triumphing there, triumphing all over the United Kingdom, coming back to Broadway, reviving vaudeville at the Palace Theater to a day, a four week contract that lasted 19 weeks, got her a special Tony. And it was the success of all that that led to Warner Brothers hiring her to do Star is Born. And when Stars Born didn't work out between Stars Born and Nuremberg, it was again on the road uh, 100, 200, 300 uh, live performances, plus albums for Capitol Records, plus TV specials for CBS. And that brings us to the early 1960s, which is where Get TV and the Judy Garland show come in. And we're going to take a quick break. But before I do take that break, I do want to mention that for those folks who think that Over the Rainbow is the best performance by Judy Garland on screen. All you have to do is watch The Man Who Got Away in A Star Is Born. I think that might be one of the finest screen performances by any actor, any film, any time from Hollywood's golden age. It was a remarkable achievement, and I think you might agree with that too. Oh, definitely. And the, one of the interesting things to look at when you see The Man That Got Away in A Star Is Born is the fact that it's all one take. George Cukor turned on the camera and just let her do it. So there's no uh, break in the emotion. It's all, you're there and you. it's like she never blinks, you never blink because she's giving it and you're taking it in. It, she did that a lot. We're going to come back with John Fricke who is going to talk about the Get TV specials that are airing for 26 weeks, the entire season of the Judy Garland Show, part of their variety programming block on Mondays. The first week was uh, on the 12th of October. Uh, let's take a quick break, and then we're going to come back and talk about her television career uh, on CBS. You know what we mean. Let there be bluebirds, a lark and a dog. But first of all, please, 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 let there be love. Hi. 
Welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4450. A lot of time we don't even know what's wrong with us and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So we're only a phone call away. Thank you. Let's continue our conversation here on Forgotten Hollywood on Therapy Cable with John Fricke. He is a cinematic historian and a particularly strong historian on everything Judy Garland. Uh, we would be remiss if we didn't, um, well, so far we've buried the lead, which of course is the idea that Judy Garland is now featured on Get TV each and every Monday. As a matter of fact, it airs more than just one time a week. Tell us a little bit about this project and how you have managed to uh, latch on to a very, very special opportunity to see a program that hasn't been aired in its entirety the whole season in 50 years. Well, I'm very lucky Get TV more or less found me because of my uh, work, the books on Judy and Oz and the documentaries, the CDs, the DVDs. And Daryl Payne, the gentleman who owns the uh, U.S. rights to the Garland series, put Get TV in touch with me and said, this is somebody I trust, which is a very nice thing to say. And uh, they found out, this will come as a shock to you, Get TV found out that I could talk. <laughs> and um, they have. You're had very familiar on television. I don't know how they couldn't think that. <laughs> well, not everybody hangs out on TCM waiting for John Fricky said or Stichels. But let's be honest. <laughs> but um, they they found out that I had knowledge about the shows and was very willing to uh, promote their schedule. And what Get TV has done, which I think is wonderful, is they have gone through all the red tape with the unions and the guilds and everything to get the rights to show these shows and make them um, financially viable for the network. And every Monday night there's a three-hour variety block that they're bringing back. Eight o'clock, these are all Eastern times, eight o'clock an episode of the Judy Garland show, nine o'clock an episode of another musical variety special of the that era. And at 10 o'clock, an episode of the Merv Griffin talk show, back from the 60s and 70s when Merv had every great entertainer, singer, actor, dancer, politician, writer. Uh, it, it shows what TV used to be when people were interesting without 72 edits per minute and flash powder and strobe lights and neon and boa constrictors and <laughs> rotten language. And I don't mean to sound like an old poop because there's room for everything, but it's it's a lovely reminder of talent. One of the great forgotten co-hosts too, Arthur Treacher. <laughs> oh, love Arthur Treacher. But uh, the great thing too about the, the Get TV schedule for those people who can't catch it at 8, 9, and 10, 5, 6, and 7 Pacific time, 8, 9, and 10 Eastern time, uh, the block is then repeated on Monday night. So uh, it's 5, 6, and 7, and then again at 8, 9, and 10 in California, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 1 on the East Coast, and then the three-hour block is on again Friday afternoons, 1, 2, and 3 Eastern time, and uh, on Sunday mornings, 9, 10, and 11 Eastern time. So you get four chances uh, to see this. They've done um, first episode of Judy series with Mickey Rooney, her great screen partner as a guest. They did a Carol, uh, Carol Channing Pearl Bailey special uh, when the two women were known as Broadway's leading Hello Dolly stars. Merv's show had Carl Reiner, Josephine Premis, uh, Robert, uh, Kennedy. Robert Kennedy. Senator Robert Kennedy. Yeah, it's just amazing. And yeah. the weeks ahead, um, one of the great things about the Garland show, CBS, NBC, and ABC all were in a bidding war to get her for a series in late 1962 because she had become unexpectedly the greatest star in the world again by dint of that talent. After all the years of everything else, in 1959 at 37, she was told she could never work again. She had been so seriously ill with hepatitis. And she was delighted. You know, she'd been working since she was two, more or less, and full time since she was 10. And she was very happy to take the time off. But as in the case of all of her marriages, none of her husbands could really support her. If she didn't work, the family didn't eat. 
So when she recuperated, she went back to touring. But instead of the vaudeville kind of shows she'd done in the 50s with the dancers and the supporting acts and the choreography, she went out and the programs read Act One, Judy, Act Two, More Judy. And this was the famous concert tour in 60 and 61 that took her from the Palladium to Amsterdam to Paris to the Newport Jazz Festival, the Hollywood Bowl, and especially Carnegie Hall, the great two-record set that was on the top of the charts for 13 weeks, on the charts for 96 weeks, five Grammys, her big TV special with Sinatra and Martin, which was CBS's biggest rating hit in their history up to 1962. And at this point, Judgment at Nuremberg, the Academy Award nomination, they all wanted her for a weekly show, and CBS got her. Uh, unfortunately, her agents, who were very anxious to sell Judy to CBS for the money, and for her money too, but they would be doing very well, no question, uh, they weren't experienced enough to say, okay, we've got to fight for a good time slot for her. And CBS put her on opposite Bonanza, which was in color on NBC, the number one show that CBS had been trying to knock out of the box for several seasons. And Judy's special with Sinatra and Martin had decimated Bonanza in the ratings a year and a half earlier. So it made some sense. But she was following the Ed Sullivan show, and two hours of variety on a Sunday night was too much. And uh, Freddie Fields and David Beagleman didn't fight for a good time slot. Then they let the network run roughshod over the show. George Slaughter, the first producer, did the first five shows as big specials, showcasing Judy Garland, world's greatest entertainer. But CBS wanted her to be more uh, appealing to the South and the Midwest, and they wanted her to be Dinah Shore and Gary Moore and Hostessy and um, The Girl Next Door, which Judy Garland had not been The Girl Next Door for 20 years at that point. Right. Uh, she, was, she was the best. Um, she went along with the phony formats. She makes them all work, and people watching Get TV this season on Monday nights or in the repeats will have a chance to see her go from being Miss Show Business to being the host to being Miss Show Business to being in concert. It, it's amazing what she achieved in those 26 weeks against a lot of odds because you are seeing Judy Garland at age 41 at the peak of her adult powers. She's in great physical shape. She's trim. She's got great clothes. Uh, and she sings not only the things you expect her to sing, trolley song, Man That Got Away, Rainbow. She sings things that you never expect to hear a woman sing. On her first show, she closed with Old Man River. Wonderful now, Old Man River is not a oh, song yeah. that a 41-year-old woman in an Edith Head sheath normally does. But when she did it, you would swear you've never heard the song sung better by anybody. Right. She also does things like uh, in shows to come, As Long As He Needs Me. Things from, you know, new Broadway shows. It wasn't just standards and, and her stuff. It's, it's amazing. And then the guest list, because everybody wanted to be on the Judy Garland show. She was Judy Garland. So across the weeks, you see uh, Barbara Streisand, pre-Funny Girl on Broadway, whom Judy demanded a uh, CBS book for her show, because Judy had so much respect for Barbara already. But Tony Bennett, Peggy Lee... Uh, Diane Carroll, Lena Horne, Bobby Darren, Steve Allen, uh, Carl Reiner, Tony Bennett, uh, Tony, yeah, the um, Ray Bolger, the Scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz. They have a wonderful reunion show. Vic Damone, one of the great pop male voices of that era up, up till the present, and he did three episodes with Judy and as he has gone on record as saying, he said, I didn't do them so that I could sing a solo on TV. I did them so I could do those duets with Judy Garland. And of course and Mickey Rooney I, too. The very first show right. she said to CBS, I can't do the first one with anybody but Mickey, he's my partner. And you see her working hard. I, I think the best description of the Judy Garland show came from her daughter Liza. Uh, about, oh gosh, 24 years ago now, a wonderful journalist named Steve Sanders wrote a book about the Garland series called Rainbow's End. And Steve, God bless him, is no longer with us, or he'd be sitting here talking to you <laughs> today. He, Steve and I had been friends for 35 years when he passed away, and he always said, John Fricke has all of Judy's career but nine months. He said, I'll take the nine months of the TV series and let John handle the rest. But he managed to interview 80 people who had been around for or involved in the TV show for this book, Rainbow's End, well worth anybody's tracking down. 
And he even uh, managed to speak to Liza because the kids don't talk much about their mom, for the record. Uh, I've been lucky to have Lorna, her daughter, as a friend. Lorna, who wrote an intro for one of the books I did on Judy. But Steve got a, was supposed to be 15 minutes with Liza and ended up being like an hour and a half. And she said very, right from the heart, she said, I am so glad the TV series is there. It makes me miss her more than ever. But you are going to see... The, the TV series is the best exemplification of what my mother was really like. The humor, the warmth, the sense of fun, the energy, the desire to please, it's, it's all there in these 26 weeks. Well, we're looking forward to seeing, we've seen, uh, I've seen at least one of the episodes I'm looking, I, it's must-see TV for me, obviously. In fact, we have a clip of Barbara Streisand and Judy Garland from The Judy Garland Show in one of their great moments. Happy! Welcome back to Forgotten Hollywood on Therapy Cable. John Fricke, thank you so much uh, for being with us and really sharing these wonderful memories about Judy Garland. Again, on Get TV, people can watch where? Well, every Monday night, it's the Variety Block, 8, 9, and 10 Eastern, but then repeated again immediately, uh, 11, 12, and 1. As in the West Coast, it's 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And the three-hour block is repeated on Friday afternoons, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock Eastern, and on Sunday mornings, 9, 10, and 11 o'clock Eastern. Get TV is a digital cable channel. It's also available by antenna, and it's available in more than 70% of the country. So people can go to get.tv on their Internet and find out which stations in their areas carry the Judy Garland Show. John Fricke, you are a delight, a wealth of knowledge and information, and I hope to see you more on television. Thank you for spending treasure time with us here on Forgotten Hollywood on Therapy Cable. Anytime, Manny. Ask me back, and we'll do this again. Thanks I'd very much. I'd love to. And I'm Manny Pacheco reminding you, let's never forget. <laughs>